Hello everyone, welcome to Audio Nordica. I'm Stephen. I've got this Mad 3020i on the bench today. This has come from a subscriber to my channel, so thank you very much. And it's reported to me that this amplifier, it works, but after it's been running for a while, apparently uh, one channel starts to cut in and out. So before I attempt to reproduce the fault, I'm just going to take the lid off and just have a bit of an inspection inside just so that I can appraise myself what sort of general condition this amplifier is in. So I do notice that there is a little bit of corrosion on the lid. Hopefully there isn't any corrosion in the electronics. Okay, so here we are, having a look inside. First glance, it doesn't look too bad. I mean, it's, yeah, it, it needs a good clean. It's a bit, bit dusty. But doesn't look, doesn't look too bad there. You can see all the dust on the bottom of the chassis. But apart from that, it looks pretty clean. And this side of the circuit board looks pretty clean. So I think for um, step one, this unit is, is fairly dusty inside. So I'm just going to give it a blowout with the compressor just to get all of this nasty dust out. Okay, so I've given this a good blowout with the compressor now. It's still a bit grubby, so I could probably use more of a clean later on. But anyway, all the loose dust and hair and stuff is out. So I'm now going to uh, see what this unit does under operation. We have a power light. And we have noise. Now that noise, that sine wave, does not sound as clean to me as it should. It sounds like there's a hiss or something on it. So if I just... This is coming from the unit. Um, I don't think there should be that much hiss. So that doesn't seem quite right. Increase the input, decrease the gain. Doesn't sound too bad at low volumes. But if I 
as soon as I take the gain up to about, the volume up to about um, 10 o'clock, I hear that hiss, which just doesn't seem right at all. So a little bit more investigation, I think, is required. So I've now got the SIGGEN plug straight into the, the amplifier in stage. Um, so this is bypassing the preamp. And not surprisingly, that hiss is completely gone. Um, we know it had to be on the preamp stage because the volume control affected it. So the volume controls on the preamp stage. So, um, but the amplifier stage itself seems pretty good. However, the customer did report that it was um, cutting in and out um, after it had been running for a while. So um, it's possible I could be looking at two problems here. Um, can only fix one problem at a time. So a bit more investigation just to see exactly what's going on. Okay, guys, there's an old saying, sometimes the answer's staring you in the face and you don't notice it because it's so obvious. Um, the first board I noticed when I pulled the lid off was this one. And... This is not meant to be here. And it's pretty obvious when you look at the rear panel because you can see these mounting screws are right through the, the label for the amplifier. And then also this hole for this DIN connector uh, is quite rough. There's a really rough burr around that where this has been drilled in the back panel and uh, it hasn't been cleaned up. So there's this um, ribbon cable here that comes out of this board and these two wires uh, run underneath the board and tack onto the back of one of these um, capacitors, so that's power. And then the other wires, they run over here um, to just next to the volume control. Now the overlay indicates that where these have been tacked in there's actually meant to be two links. So the, it looks like the links have been taken out and this has been tacked in. So um, someone will have done this to allow connecting up a DIN cable to this amplifier. I don't know whether this is causing our, our his problem but I won't be surprised if it is. Okay guys, I just rolled it over to have a look at that cable I just mentioned. I haven't got that far yet because I just found something else. Um, I'm not sure how well you can see it, but I just came across these. Two great big um, wires hanging out of the bottom. These are actually leads for um, a small toroidal inductor. And it doesn't look like they've ever been trimmed from the day it was built in the factory. So you know, having leads like that floating around is really bad because if they short to something, you know, you could just get lucky and probably did. But you know, it's always worked because they just weren't shorting. But they've just never been trimmed. So that's that one. And that's that one. I mean, NAD had a reputation for quality control problems um, later on because you know one of the genius of these amplifiers when they first came out in 1979 was the quality of sound for an affordable price compared to what amplifiers sold then and the way they made them affordable was making them so that they could build them a whole lot more cheaply that didn't necessarily mean cheaper components but Designing the board so that the whole thing could be um, wave soldered, minimizing uh, manual processes. So it's obvious that this board has been wave soldered 
um, because the components are just lying all over the place, just wherever they happen to be sitting when it got waved. Um, but there's too much lead sticking out of that inductor and it hadn't been trimmed at manufacture. So just having a look at these one, two, three, four, it should be pretty obvious that that is certainly not factory. That's that um, ribbon cable going up to that board that's been added in. And yeah, that, that is what we call a bodge. Okay guys, so I have taken the bodge out of circuit and reinstated the links and the unit is on and that's volume full bore and I hear no hiss at all coming out of those speakers. It was kicking in about 10 o'clock before. So if I turn on the SIG gen, that is much better. So, you know, that is, that is just bizarre. That, bodge this circuit board presumably so that someone could plug in a a din cable has effectively ruined this amplifier now i don't know maybe it was okay if you had the um something plugged into the din but um that's just not the way to do things honestly so I really can't imagine, I mean, it's a fair amount of effort someone's gone to as well to do this. Now, also, what led me to this was that I noticed these joints look really dodgy here. And this joint here, it's so hot that I can't even leave my finger on it. Um, there's a great big power resistor under there, but it's, it's getting so hot that... Yeah, that's, that's really hot, and this joint is so hot that I can't touch it. That just doesn't, that's just bizarre. So, yeah, bad, bad, bad bodges. There's no such thing as a good bodge. Um, so that's just nasty. So anyway, the good news is, is that that problem that I certainly observed from Power Up with, with Hiss is now gone. So I'll report back to the owner what I've found so far. Uh, I'll recommend that we take this out altogether, and I'm sure he'll agree. Unfortunately, he'll end up with a hole in the back of his unit, but anyway, at least it's not in the front. Um, so I recommend that this comes out, and then I just need to give this thing um, a, a bench burn-in to find out whether there are any other problems and then proceed with a service. So this is the culprit. It's a remote control board. So this is a LM1035, which is a uh, volume control balance tone control IC. And this was wired up in series with the volume control on this amplifier. So I'm presuming that this um, DIN connector went off to some other module that had an IR receiver in it and somehow controlled this LM1035. Um, but for whatever reason this was this was causing that noise and certainly could well have also been the cause of the the fault that the customer um, reported of the channel dropping in and out. So I've restored the wire links that had been taken out where that board was uh, wired in. You can see the um, this is where it was mounted. So unfortunately we've got these holes in the back chassis which haven't been drilled all that neatly in the first place. Okay, so I've just given this a good test uh, on my speakers and it sounds pretty good so fingers crossed um, this was the main problem with it so I've pulled out one of the um, power supply caps 
just to do a ESR test on that one. And that is fine. So I'll pull the other one out and see how it looks. So the second capacitor is underneath this bar. So this is going to have to come out first. And of course, to get this bar out, there's a screw right here, which meant that the front panel had to come off. And here's the second capacitor. Yeah, I think that's okay. The ESR floats around sometimes. But I think that's fine. Okay, so the next step is um, alignment. So to adjust the bias current, um, unlike the earlier models, this one actually has a pot in it one free channel, but for some reason, this is one of them here, it's got this great big blob of silicon over it. Um, this is the other one here, which does not have the blob, but this one does, so I'm going to have to remove this before I can adjust this resistor. Well, that didn't end well. Um, as you can see, the top has come off the pot, and I'm actually using the camera for magnification, because I can get better magnification out of this iPhone than I can get with my Maggie lamp. I don't have a microscope. But th that shaft looks corroded. So I'm almost half wondering, I mean I know it sounds a bit crazy, but I'm wondering if the top had been, like the wiper had been siliconed on or something because this this pot was on the way out. It's very odd that one of them had that goop over it and the other one didn't. Anyway, it's all a bit academic now. The point is, is that this pot needs to be replaced. So um, I do not have one, so I'm going to have to order one in. And obviously this pot controls the bias, so we can't operate the unit until we get the pot in and replaced. Okay, so I've pulled this pot out, and look at that. That looks just absolutely terrible. Um, it is. It's, it's basically... It's rusted out, this thing. So how it was ever working, I'll never know. But um, it certainly needs to be replaced and has needed to be for quite a long time. Okay, so next step, I'm going to demount these power devices. So one, two, three, four, five, six power devices. Um, this thermal compound tends to dry out. I mean, it might be okay, but can't really tell for sure without pulling it out. It should be changed. I've got some nice sill pads that I'm going to put in there instead. Uh, much less mess, much nicer, I think. So uh, we'll get these devices out and get those changed over. Now, this will be a little bit interesting because these are the devices uh, here and there's these funny straps um, going across here. I mean, it does look like it's factory to me, um, but it's it's for grounding for, for some reason. Um, but yeah, there you are. But anyway, the point is, is that I need to access these, here are the pins for the devices and these screws will have to come out. So it's just a little bit tricky, but We'll see how we go. So the way I'm going to do this is, is just like this. Um, a good old solder braid. And yeah, I think, I think that will work. Um, I won't bore you by showing it all on camera, but that's what I'm going to do. Okay, so I actually used the solder sucker to get out the worst of it, and now, because um, it's just too much, use too much braid otherwise, but I just clean up the last of it with the braid. Um, this would be a whole lot better off with a, a proper desoldering gun, 
but I do not have one at this stage. Thinking about getting one, um, but right now I don't have one. Okay, so these uh, devices are out, uh, as is the heatsink, so this is going to get cleaned up in a tick. And these will get cleaned up. So a couple of things to note. Um, the little insulation sleeves, absolutely critical that all of those go back in because the case cannot short to the heatsink. And if you just put the screws through without those insulation things in there, that's exactly what happened and you will blow up the finals. Um, also, you can see the, the rust on this case. Um, I'm going to try to clean this up, but yeah, it really looks like this unit has been stored in a damp environment, maybe a garage or somewhere. You can see also the um, the shake proof of the star washers are rusty as well, so um, I'm pretty sure I've got some replacements for those handy, so I'll just replace those and um, I think the nuts should be okay once they're cleaned up a bit. So I need to get this all cleaned up. And once that's done, we'll be ready to put it back in with some new sill pads. So this is all cleaned up now. Um, these nuts came out fine. I'm thinking they might be stainless because there's no sign of rust on those. Um, it's just these these um, shake proof washers, star washers will need to be replaced as I mentioned before um, but the cans on these TO3 devices are quite corroded. I've cleaned this one up here and what I used was this um, Autosol metal polish just with a um, Q-tip and that seems to have come up pretty nicely actually. There's a little bit of pitting in the metal which probably can't really see. Um, you'd really have to look closely to notice it. So I've done that one. This one has not been done. So I think it certainly is is worthwhile doing just to get rid of the, the absolute worst of this corrosion. So this has been really frustrating. It took a week or so for these um, M3 star washers to come in to replace these rusted out ones. It should have been a next day delivery, but it took seven days instead, uh, for reasons I won't go into. Um, if I'd have known it was going to take that long, I would have gone and gotten them myself. But anyway, I had them on order, so finally they've turned up. So um, this means that I can put all of these things back in and get this thing together and hopefully working and properly biased. Um, so things to note in the reassembly is the bolts go in from the bottom side. Uh, easy mistake to make is that you know you would think that they'd go in from the top side like so. No, they do not. Uh, they come in from the bottom. And also, as I mentioned earlier, we've got to make sure I get we get our little um, insulating um, sleeves, I suppose, um, on our um, bolts so that they don't um, short to the heatsink because that would be catastrophic. Okay, so that ended up being very fiddly, so I didn't do it on camera, but as you can see, I've got the new uh, sill pads in for the final transistors and for the pre-drivers, or the drivers. So um, that's done. Now, recall that there's this um, pot trim pot that goes here for setting the bias that one that had rusted out and disintegrated so we need to replace that okay so now we're back to our um, biasing procedure so the first thing according to the factory procedure is to um, adjust the DC offset voltage um, there's a couple of trim pots for those so according to the spec it should be um, less than plus or minus 30 millivolts. So that's actually pretty good. But I'll just see if I can give it a little bit more of a tweak. I mean, it's probably going to drift a little bit. It does say to go back and readjust it, so I don't need to be too 
um, fussy about that at the moment. If we look at the other channel, it's not too bad either. So I need R412 uh, for that. There we are. That's close enough for now, so I'll come back to those. So now I need to remove some solder shorts on the bottom of the board so that we can measure the idle current. Okay, so the resistor that we have to measure across is this one here, um, uh, 455, five, and there are two test points. Um, it doesn't actually say here what the test points are for, neither does it say in the procedure, but you can see when you look under the PCB that these indeed are the test points for measuring the bias. So if we just have a look under the board now, we can see this bridge here is shorting out that resistor and these are the test points here and then we've got the same deal over here so we just need to remove these two solder bridges and then connect up to those test points and that's where we'll measure our bias okay so we just need to get rid of this solder bridge And also, that solder bridge. Okay, so we've got the um, first one hooked up. This is actually the one where we replaced the trim pot and so I just centered it when I put it in as a wild guess and it's actually not too bad. So the procedure says the initial setting is set it to 26 to 30 millivolts. So we'll just set it to, yeah, that's pretty close. We'll just set it to 26 for now. because we've got to leave it warm up for five minutes and do the final adjustment after it's warmed up. And now I just do the other channel. So this is the other channel. I haven't adjusted it, but it's, it's pretty close. You can just see it creeping up as the thing warms up. So I might, I probably don't need to, but I'll just tweak it down just a little bit just to follow the procedure. That's fine. And so now I'll just let this um, I'll just let this sit for five minutes and we do the final adjustment. Okay, so now we do the, the final adjustment. So first we adjust the DC offset. Spec is less than 30 millivolts, but just go as close to zero as we can. That's nice. And we'll just do the other channel now. There we are. Nice. And now back to the idle current. So we're aiming to adjust for 30. Pretty good. 
other channel. Tweak. This is the old trim pot so it's just not quite as nice to adjust but there we go that's pretty close now we just need to bridge out these again One, that's two. So now I've just got this yucky looking flux around these various places. Um, where I've done things, so I'm just going to clean that up just using some ISO. So I don't think it really needs it, but originally these did have some Loctite on them. Um, looks like it was light Loctite blue, and Loctite blue is what I'm going to use. So I'm just going to apply a little bit of that um, just after the fact, um, like so. Ideally, I'd prefer to add it um, to the threads when doing it up, but it just makes too much of a mess. Um, and you end up with Loctite in places it's not meant to be. So, just do it like this. There we are. So time to start reassembly. So firstly this bottom bar goes in and it goes around this way because it has this locating um, lug here which mates with in here. Now the two screws that hold the PCB down to that bar Now for the front panel. So the front panel on these things looks like it's aluminium, but it's not. It's just plastic, um, which is a bit of a shame because they tend to get a bit scratched up, as this one is, um, especially around the corners, you know, when they take impacts and so on, they get bent in, gouged or whatever. Um, It'd look absolutely fantastic if someone were to make aluminium reproductions for these. But yeah, these were built to a price. So um, you could imagine how much more it would have cost to make it out of metal. So these little um, cloth for fill up felt insulating doodads go on here. OK, 
Okay. Got to make sure that the LED lines up with the cutout. Let's see how we go. Yes. Okay, good. Everything's lining up, so we'll just put the screws in for that. Okay, guys, we've had a bit of a catastrophe here. Um, I've had this thing almost done, and then I just realized that um, there's a couple of power devices that are used for the regulation of the supply lines that basically drive everything except for the um, final power transistors. And there's a couple of pan power um, pass transistors that make those rails. And so there's just a little uh, metal plate on those as heatsink. And so I thought that I should um, just change the thermal compound. So I put steel pads on those as well. Now, the problem is, is that in doing so, um, I, I really should have removed, so this is the lesson to learn from this, I should have removed the devices before removing the heat sinks because in undoing the mounting hardware it stressed the um, solder joints and it actually put a micro crack um, on the circuit board just adjacent to one of the pads. So what that meant is it lost the positive supply rail and um, which resulted in negative 35 volts on the speaker terminals. Um, so as you can see, I've got it working again now. Um, took me a little while to find that, but um, basically I found that the, the positive rails were missing. And I got to a point where I was measuring the, the pass transistor and I could see basically voltage going straight through the pass transistor, 50 volts going straight through the pass transistor, but not present on the capacitor that is supposed to be directly connected to it. So that's where I found the open circuit. So I'll show you in a second, but uh, we have got this going. The reason why it's not hooked up to my test speakers is unfortunately I blew um, both of my test speakers. Um, which is a bit disappointing, but this is the reason why I got them. Um, so that, you know, nothing expensive was blown up, hopefully. So a bit of a learning lesson there anyway. And I'm just going to see if I can show you... Just... Here, it's the, the far pin. You'll see you've got a little solder bridge running down to the track. Just had to do the old trick of scraping the um, solder resist off the track to get to the copper and then put that little bridge there. And that has resolved the short circuit. And I'll just quickly turn it over. It is on, so I'm just being careful. Just to show you these two power devices. Um, this is the one here that had the crack uh, in the track and then the other one is just there hiding underneath this ribbon cable. So those two, you just see they've got these little plates um, which are actually quite warm. Ooh, they are rather warm now. Um, so that's that problem resolved. Um, but because this has happened, I would just like to give this thing more of a test um, before I'm satisfied that it's right. So I've given this unit a good test on the bench and the covers are back on. So I believe that this NAD 3020i is now ready to give many more years of service. So thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you did, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. And I look forward to seeing you on the next one. Bye for now.